What's up, everyone? Rich Piana here. You're listening to Muscle Science and Applications, so stay tuned, and soon you'll be listening to me. Muscle performance and nutrition research reviewed daily. Real-world application tips, case studies from top professionals and athletes. You're listening to Muscle Science and Application. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. My guest today is an elite powerlifter with best lifts of 1025 in the squat, 832 in the bench, and 722 in the deadlift with a history training under Louis Simmons and West Side Barbell. Prior to powerlifting, he was even a professional wrestler. He is known for his revolutionary product to aid in shoulder health and strength in the bench press called the Slingshot. There are now multiple versions of the Slingshot, along with a whole line of powerlifting products under the Slingshot brand. These products have recently been picked up by Bodybuilding.com, and this guest has even released a shoe with Reebok. My guest also owns The Power Magazine and is a co-host on Mark Bell's Powercast, which piggybacks his highly successful YouTube channel, supertraining.tv, which often has lots of footage shot in and around his super training gym in Sacramento, California. Super training hosts powerlifting meets as well as many other events. The guest's brother Chris even directed the film Bigger, Stronger, Faster, and I always handpick my guests, and there are three main reasons why I uh, picked this guest for today. Number one is that he advocates learning from everyone, powerlifters, bodybuilders, crossfitters, strongmen, you name it. He also recognizes a variety of techniques can produce big lifts, and so he gets very individualized in his coaching of technique in the powerlifts and things. And, you know, there's more than one way to uh, achieve a good lift, and so I like the way he's open to that. Doesn't always tell everyone they have to do every movement looking exactly the same. And then finally, for the focus of today's show, he's launched several highly successful products and businesses, and so I think he has a ton to share on that front. And so it's my pleasure to welcome to the show, Mark Bell. What's up? <laughs> Not too much. How's the weather out there in California? It's ridiculous. It was like 85 degrees yesterday. It's insane. It's really nice. Today is a little windy, but it's uh, still sunny out there. Yeah, it's crazy. It's been way warmer than normal here in Salt Lake City, like 65, 70 degrees for several days now. Utah. I just had a guy visit my gym from Utah. Uh, the uh, the jumping guy, uh, Ryan Moody. You know Ryan Moody? Box jump world champion. He's got a world record in a box jump, and he goes around and does, uh, they're called explosive seminars. I actually went to it uh, this weekend. It was pretty cool. Not just box jumping, but he just explains, you know, hip extension and uh, explosive power in general. Pretty pretty cool seminar. Nice. So did you host that right at Super Training? Uh, we didn't host it. It was just at a gym down the street from me, so I wanted to go check it out. I always like to try to, like you mentioned already, is, uh, you know, I like to try to learn from everybody. You know, he's, he's a scrawny little guy, skinny guy, but, you know, he deadlifts 655. He obviously has a lot of explosive power in him somewhere, you know. Yeah, that's really cool that you went down there to check that out. So let's use that to start right in on this first topic, this idea that, you know, obviously you've been very successful in powerlifting, you run a very successful gym, and yet you still keep an open mind to learning from all these different communities, recognizing they all bring something to the table. And so maybe you can reflect on that, uh, this idea of kind of humbling yourself and uh, getting the best from everyone that's around you. Yeah, my friend, uh, um, <clears throat> Zach Evanesh, uses the uh, term uh, white belt mentality. So you can be a black belt, you can be a ninja, <laughs> but there's still a lot of great warriors to learn from. There's always, there's always people to learn from. Uh, there's always things to learn. And um, I just uh, have always seen a direct correlation between lifting and life in general. And, um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the greatest business minds, the greatest leaders, um, you know, they've, they've taken, they've extracted uh, information from multiple areas, not just one. And uh, that's been my mission with strength training is to, you know, realize that um, a lot of bodybuilders are really strong. Some crossfitters are strong. Some powerlifters are insanely strong. But a lot of times when you're only in that little bubble, um, you... Uh, it's it's not always a good thing. It's not always a good thing when you're only inside that little bubble because you're not thinking outside the box at all, and you're not exposed to different types of training. They say the best training method is the one you're currently not doing, and uh, I'm a big believer in that. And that basically just kind of goes back to the fact that you can't do everything all at once, um, but a little bit of bodybuilding, a little bit of conditioning work. I always say you should look like you lift. You shouldn't just be big and fat. 
You shouldn't just be skinny. You should be somewhere in between. You should look like you live. You should look athletic. You should look like you can kick some ass. Yeah, no, I like that. Could you maybe give us a specific example where you uh, integrated something from something kind of outside of your main realm and it really uh, boosted your training or maybe even a, a client of yours and things just went through the roof? <clears throat> I would have to say um, just uh, some simple uh, strongman training has been great with some of the some of the uh, power lifters that I train. And, you know, some people might not think that's too far outside the box. Well, they, they're worlds apart with those two sports. Uh, a farmer's mm-hmm. walk and a deadlift, while they may seem like they're close re- re- related because, you know, it involves picking up an object, um, a farmer's walk also takes conditioning, um, and it takes uh, it t- it's a certain skill that you have to kind of learn on, on exactly how to use those, uh, those implements. But... Um, so a little bit of little bit of strongman training go a long way, I think, for any sport. Uh, I've also, uh, when I worked with uh, some football kids, I was training uh, high school kids. Uh, we implemented a lot of strongman training, and it had a, a huge, profound impact on how they played on the field. The strongman training in football, are, you know, they're not related at all, really. But um, the type of strength that you could build up through strongman uh, had a profound effect. Where I see it the most, though, most common, and the probably the the most drastic of, uh, well, there's several examples, but uh, probably the biggest, most drastic difference is when you see someone who has a gymnastics background and they come in and they, they power lift or they do CrossFit and they immediately just start destroying everybody or Olympic lifting um, because they're so strong relative to their own body weight. They're used to their own body in space and they're used to moving their body around explosively and so when they go to do powerlifting they're already that f- much further ahead of the game um, bodybuilding would be another example um, and I think the aspects of bodybuilding where their main focus isn't on strength is actually a healthy one because I think you can get too caught up in the numbers sometimes if you're stuck at a 600 pound deadlift that might just be all you're thinking about all the time and every time you go to do it and every time you miss it you're bummed out about it Whereas a bodybuilder is thinking, you know what, I'm going to work on, you know, doing, um, you know, 455 for eight. Next time I want to do 475 for eight. And so they have a different mentality completely. And then one day out of the blue, just for fun, they're lifting and they feel good. They're like, you know what, I'm try 600 a day. And sure enough, bam, they blast it up because they've been building their strength and not necessarily just testing their strength. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's a valuable lesson there. I like that. Um, and let's just piggyback that with this idea again of, you know, you're always talking about the, the coach's eyes and you review different people's techniques. And unlike a lot of people where I see it, so, you know, like you, you must break at the hips first, or you must break at the knees, or if you do this, you're wrong, or you do that, you're wrong. I feel like you're kind of good at being able to say, well, for this person, it seems like this is working or whatnot. Uh, maybe give some thoughts on that and how you kind of came to that point where did you used to have a one method that you always taught or? Um, I would say that that mainly came from uh, me messing up and uh, people trying to coach me uh, inside of a box and people trying to kind of like, I guess, paint me into a corner basically and try to train me the way they would train everybody else. Nobody uh, was able to help me with my squat. Um, Ultimately, it is important that you should know, you should all know and you should all realize that the only one who's ultimately going to be able to help you is yourself. That's important and that's why I try to extract from as many different people as I can, then what happens is you're able to then apply it to yourself at some point. Um, but <clears throat> in the squat in particular, uh, people kept telling me, oh, you know, your chest came down on that when you rounded over on the squat. I'm like, no shit. Happens to me every time I squat. It, it kind of looks like I'm basically throwing up into a toilet every time I do a heavy squat. So I had to kind of think about how the hell can I maintain proper positioning in, in the squat and the answer for anybody uh, isn't to over-exaggerate the opposite end of that spectrum. The answer is to try to find the strongest position that you can, and then from there just try to maintain that position. So you'll have to try to figure out how you can maintain that position uh, throughout the entire lift, throughout the entire range of motion. Um, many people get too caught up in, yeah, you know, how, how exactly the form should be. Uh, your head needs to be up or your chest needs to be up. It, it, it can be true for some, um, but for many, it's not. I've seen a lot of people throw their head up 
and then their knees shoot forward too much. Um, I've seen some coaches get upset when people's knees shoot forward, and that's not always uh, necessarily a negative thing. I've seen coaches get upset about people's knees coming in. That's not always the worst thing. I mean, it's not great. It's not the safest thing, but there are reasons why these uh, default positions happen, and I think you just have to realize that we're we're all built so differently. Uh, even even as a kid, I remember it was me, my brother, and one of my friends. We all worked out together, and we all weighed about two ten, all three of us. But we couldn't have looked different. We're all built entirely differently. So uh, even when you have people of similar weight or similar height, they're oftentimes just going to move much much differently. Mm-hmm. And so. What's what's your typical process? I guess you know when when say let's let's just go with a powerlifter comes to you, and you know I don't know say their deadlifts like five fifty and they've always wanted to deadlift six hundred or something, and do, is it always technique work mostly or that you find is the is the culprit or is it more the the overall programming and how do you come to that conclusion? The number one problem is always strength. Um, mm. You know, it's always the uh, number one issue is uh, just simply. Uh, finding a way to get that individual stronger. And normally what we find from newer individuals or newer coaches uh, that I'm around, or if I do a seminar or something along those lines, what we find is that uh, the the people that I'm dealing with simply just aren't going heavy uh, as often as they should be. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll get around some new people for a while, and they'll they'll just be like, you know, they'll come to my gym, they'll see us work out, or I'll do a seminar and I'll, I'll work out before the seminar. And I'll have people come up to me and be like, damn, man, like I just got to, I got to just lift heavier. Like I, gotta, I need to start doing more singles. I need to start doing more doubles. And um, so for a lot of these athletes, um, they may be doing repetitions. They may, their focus may be, may have been at some point somewhere else. Uh, they may have been doing, uh, you know, fives to five or threes to five. They're not really drawing upon their, their absolute, uh, you know, their absolute best. Uh, in terms of their one rep maxes, they're unable to uh, show their strength uh, through a one rep max. They're unable to strain and fight through those lifts. And so usually that's the number one thing is just to simply figure out how to get uh, each person just stronger. It sounds so simple, but that's really the the main thing that we deal with. Um, And normally uh, what that entails is just a lot of sets. Not necessarily a lot of reps, but a, a shitload of sets. Um, the repetitions can vary uh, depending on the movement, uh, but usually the reps are going to be under five, and the sets might be all the way up to ten. Mm-hmm. And how do you make that decision? Also, where like you were mentioning, say like the knees going in, right? And I think most people will be like, oh, you know, telltale sign that they need to, you know, strengthen their, turn their glutes on more, and you know, do some stuff for the the outer hip and whatnot. How do you decide like when it's when enough is enough, or kind of just saying, you know what, this is the norm for that person. Yeah, what I've usually seen on that is that those things improve as the person gets better on executing the the lift itself. Mm-hmm. And so my suggestion is normally, you know, let's do one week heavy, and the next week let's work on practice. So, um, or even in the same training session, they might work up to a 405 squat, and maybe it just looks, you know, absolutely horrendous. And then so we'll say, oh, you know, let's have you do, you know, 225 for, you know, six sets of five. You know, just so they're really hammering in those repetitions and ingraining how to do the lift um, the right way. I I don't I don't get overly excited about uh, you know uh, you know weak hips or weak hamstrings. I don't really even like to define stuff like that because I don't think it's that simple. Mm-hmm. I think that the body is a uh, you know is an, is is all one uh, giant chain, and uh, you know sometimes there are weak links within that chain. But they're so hard to identify. I wouldn't jump to the conclusion uh, of saying that just because someone's knees shoot in that they have weak hips. Um, because you might say, like, for example, we had a girl in our gym this week. She, uh, her knees would shoot in on a deadlift, which usually is a sign that, yeah, you, you do have weak hips. But, however, this same girl jumps on, like, a 50-inch box. Hmm. So it's like she has some explosive power in her hips somewhere. <laughs> um, what I usually tell people is that the lift is just foreign to them. It's just mm-hmm. new to them. They haven't done it enough. So um, same thing with like CrossFitters. I'll have them do box squats, and they'll kind of plop on the box, or their hips will roll under. They'll get that uh, the butt wink thing going. Their hips will roll underneath them a little bit, and they're like, oh, man, my hamstrings are weak. It's like, well, your hamstrings aren't necessarily weak. 
It's just that you don't know how to use them yet. Sure. You don't know how to turn them on quite yet. And so once they start to learn how to, I mean, it'd be the same thing if um, I went to their gym and they're like, hey, your conditioning sucks. It's like, well, it's really no surprise. I haven't really worked on it yet. You know, give me a chance to kind of catch up. And so I just think that coaches jump to conclusions too quickly on uh, what's weak. Oftentimes, everything is a problem. Mm -hmm. So I guess in that case, then, uh, your philosophy maybe on this idea of like people saying like, oh, you got to do some prehab stuff first, or they say you know, like you never belong under heavy weight until you can do it right with lightweight. It sounds like you kind of m- mix both exposures, if you will. And then also, like you said, kind of not that you ignore prehab or those types of things, but you just use it to facilitate rather than as a prerequisite. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, you know, when I, when I did pro wrestling for a few years, um, you know, the, the, my coach would say, you know, that this guy looks great. He's in great shape. He can talk really well. And then he'll say, and then the bell rang. <laughs> and that just basically means the guy sucked once the bell rang. And the same thing with, with strength training is eventually you're going to have to lift. And there's no amount of preparation that you can do beforehand and really make yourself that much better to where it's going to look pretty. Everyone's going to start somewhere. Different people are going to start in different places, and I think you should just start. And that's the same recommendation I'd have with bands or chains or box squats or, or going heavy. I don't see any problem with people going in and starting out doing one rep maxes. Um, it is smart to like learn the movement first, have some base. I'm not saying not to have any base at all. Um, have some base and have some uh, experience with that particular lift. Uh, you know, before before you go too crazy on it, but um, yeah, you're, you're eventually going to have to, uh, to start to train. I see people, you know, foam rolling and all this stuff and it drives me nuts because I'm just like, you should never walk into a gym and then lay on the fucking floor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just break it down to the simplest form. You go in there to exercise and the first thing you're doing is laying down on the floor. I know my, for myself, I just can't, I can't get my mind to operate that way. I mean, I'll do some mobilization, I'll stretch, I'll move around, um, and I, you know, I'd rather like rub something up against a rack or something rather than to lay down. I just don't, I just don't think that that's where your mind should be. Maybe after the training session would be uh, a better place to try to, you know, correct those uh, imbalances or those tight spots or whatever. But yeah, eventually you're just going to have to start lifting, and I'd rather have people do it you know, try to work on their imperfections after a training session or on weeks in between going heavy. Gotcha. Yeah, I know. I think that's a, a certainly a reasonable approach. And we're talking up to this point mostly just about, you know, traditional training. Let's start to branch a little bit into some of your products. And so obviously after uh, years of training people on the bench, you saw some utility for uh, something like the slingshots. And maybe describe right. the origins of that a little bit and uh, how many like renditions you had to went through and how that came about. Um, let's see, the slingshot basically started out as a, uh, um, I was training for a, a contest and, uh, in my preparation for that contest, I tore my pec and, uh, I started to train about two or three weeks later again to try to see if I could, you know, prepare for this contest that I wanted to do. And I was like, you know what, I, just, I don't think it's there, you know, even though the meat's still about eight weeks away, I just. I don't think I'll recover in time, um, but it was a geared powerlifting meet. Um, and so I was like, well, maybe in a bench shirt, maybe I can still handle some weight. Maybe it's not that bad. And yeah, maybe I won't get a bench PR, but maybe I can bench well enough to, to do okay in the contest. And so what I did was um, about three weeks after, and this, this wasn't like a full on like rupture or anything. This was just a slight uh, tweak slash tear, something along those lines. And, um, so I threw on a really, really large uh, open back bench shirt. Those of you not familiar with bench shirts, um, they're made out of some crazy material. Sometimes they're made out of like denim or very, very thick forms of like polyester. They don't, they don't have any stretchy properties to them really much at all, uh, with the exception of like one style of shirt that's out there. But anyway, I just wore this huge shirt. It was made for a super heavyweight guy that weighed like 350 or 400 pounds. I weighed about 300 pounds at the time. I threw it on. I was able to do my training. And I was like, shit, you know, I still feel okay. And 
got all my parts together. Everything feels all right. I, I think I'm going to be able to, to do this contest. And so as the weeks went along, I started to make a little bit of progress and then, you know, switched over to my competition style bench shirt, which was much tighter and was able to do the meet. And I was able to, to, to do, to do well. And then I remember like about a week after the meet, I'm sitting in the gym and I have this large bench shirt on and I'm just like, you know, how do I get, okay, I have a torn pec. That's a pretty major thing, you know? Um, but there's a lot of people suffering from just other things. There's bad shoulder, shoulder surgery, um, you know, I always I used to hear people all the time say, I used to do this, I used to do that. Like, oh, I remember when I benched 315, and I'm always like, well, shit, man, why can't why can't they still do 315? What happened to them, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's people with banged up elbows and so on. So I just thought to myself, how do I get the general population to feel what I'm feeling? Because I'm hurt, but I can still do what I love. And so I played around with some different ideas. They were all really bad. Uh, I threw a shirt um, kind of like just over, not over my head, but over my arms. I put a shirt over my arms without putting it over my head. And it was a very tight compression shirt. It was a, like a, an Under Armour shirt. And it was, it was a size that was appropriate for me, but it was still tight because it was a, a compression shirt. And so I went and I benched with it and it just it didn't really work. And so then I bought like a really small shirt. And I tried that, and that didn't work either. So if you can picture it, you know, the shirt's up over my arms, but not over my head. Not, I didn't put my head through the hole of the shirt, so it's on me like a slingshot. And I tried a much tighter shirt, and that didn't really work either, but it was grabbing at the bottom a little bit, but it hurt. And uh, I was like, well, if I make something that hurts people, they're not going to they're gonna enjoy it. They're not going to like it. So I had to kind of go back to the drawing board on that, <clears throat> and then uh, just – over a period of time, kind of came up with the concept of uh, having something with some elastic properties to it and uh, had a seamstress sew the thing up. And I met her at a Starbucks and uh, right down, the, right like within 100 feet of that Starbucks, there was just a little commercial gym there. I said, wait right here. I'm going to go try this thing out. And I tried it out with 135. And I did 135 for like 20 reps real easy and really fast. And I just was like, fuck, man, this is it, you know? So I went back and I told the same person, like, I need 20 of these things. And then from there, just, you know, took the, you know, the dream and turned it into a reality. That's awesome. The manufacturer and the rest is history, I guess you'd say. Cool. So uh, how how did you find the manufacturer? There's probably some listeners that have, you know, had products they've always thought they wanted to launch and just thought maybe it was too hard or too difficult. And so everyone, you just heard there, Mark's... Uh, you know, multiple iterations, but eventually with some perseverance, he, he got it right. And then what, what were the next steps from there? Yeah, I didn't. And also, I didn't get it right at first either. It took it took a little while to find the correct material. Um, all I did was do searches on the Internet. You know, obviously, I can't uh, give people my manufacturer and stuff like that. But sure. I used the Internet. I used my I, I used my cell phone, really. At the time, I didn't have an iPad. I don't. I don't have a computer. I've never used a computer. Um, but uh, all I I just used my phone. I sit at Starbucks and I just search for stuff on my phone, and uh, you know, found uh, found found someone to manufacture my stuff. Basically. Gotcha. So just so people understand the level of perseverance that goes in, like how many how many people did you pick up the phone and they're like, nope, can't help you, or wrong thing, or. Oh well, <clears throat> so. <clears throat> You know, I guess I could rewind a little bit. Um, I had the concept for uh, for a long time, um, for a few years. And, um, you know, <clears throat> when you have an idea, like let's just say you had an idea for something strange, like a an improved microphone for podcasts or something like that, right? Sure. Well, you might have ideas on how the microphone could be better, but maybe you're not into electronics, you know? So you would be like, all right, well, I'm just going to take my idea to a couple big companies and see if they would like the idea, you know? And so that's what I did. Um, but they were like, yeah, that's not a, an idea that uh, we think would work, you know? And they, they were saying uh, one company in particular is very large in the powerlifting circuit. Um, <clears throat> they just said, we don't see how that would be marketable. Like, you know, they already make bench shirts and, I was like, well, no, this is a, a bench shirt for, like, your average, like, gym goer. This isn't, like, a real bench shirt. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be a lot more passive. It's going to be a lot more comfortable. And it's going to be, you know, a third of the price. You don't need, like, three friends to help you put it on. Yeah, 
Right. It, it's something you slide on, takes 10 seconds, and boom, you can bench 40 pounds more, 30 pounds more, depending on the person. Sure. And, yeah, they just didn't think it was a good idea. And so I was like, you know, when someone tells you that, you're kind of like, you're not just like right away, you're not like, fuck you, you know, I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, you you actually think about it more, especially when... Uh, Especially when you when it's someone who's reputable, somebody who's who's making money in the industry, it gets you thinking a little bit. You're like, maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe maybe they're right. Maybe it's not that great of an idea. And I was like, nah, it's a fucking badass idea. I need to I need to make this thing. And so over a period of time, I, uh, you know, um, it took me about two, it was about two years later that I, uh, you know, uh, got the product going. And the first go of it was bad. Um, it worked, but it, the material was weird and it smelled really funky. Mm-hmm. You can imagine that. I don't know why, but it just smelled really weird. Dude, that's perfect. Mark Smelly Bell. It, it matches. Yeah, <laughs> I know. The smelly slingshot. And um, <laughs> the other thing that was fantastic about that first run was if you wore it for a little while, it'd make you red. So, Uh-oh. like, you know, it was red and then it would make your skin red, which is awesome. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an added benefit to it, you know? Yep. I guess we can make a green one for St. Patrick's Day, which it is today. Yeah, and you can combine the two, and it's Christmas uh, Christmas ever, all year long. Yeah. Yeah. All but right. Yeah, it took a little while to, you know, get everything going, but... Um, and now, basically, I've kind of created products around the slingshot, things to go with it. The first thing I needed to do was to make uh, wrist wraps because handling extra weight in the slingshot, I was like, well... That wouldn't really be smart if you weren't wearing wrist wraps and you were handling you know, 50 pounds more than you ever handled before. You know, mm-hmm. It would only, only be smart to, to cover your wrist. And so we made wrist wraps. Now we make compression cuffs, um, which I think I have one right here. But, yeah, we have all kinds of different things that we've been, we've been working on. Compression cuff is just a simple little guy like this here. And you can put it anywhere. You can put it on your – we make one called a hammy band for those of you who have hamstring injuries. Um, our, uh, our guy that we went to the seminar the other day, uh, uh, uh Ryan Moody, uh, he's got a world record in the box jump. Um, he's been wearing it, um, for some of his box jumps and he's like, he's like, I don't know, man. He's like, I think this thing might help me, uh, you know, even jump higher, but he's someone who's always recovering from stuff. His, his hamstrings are stretching and, and shortening, and, uh, flexing very quickly throughout these jumps. And so he's something that he throws on for, um, not just compression during an exercise, but also just recovery afterwards. And this little guy, I throw it on my elbow all the time. I got some just wicked tendonitis out here. I also, when I squat, have pulled this muscle in here several times. And so, you know, as you get older, you try to just, I know there's guys out there who are like, dude, I don't want to rebel. And that's cool, whatever. But I think that it's just wise to protect yourself before you end up wrecking yourself. Um, I do think also that overloading your body is a smart idea um, in terms of, you know, throwing on a belt and lifting 30 pounds more, throwing on some elbow sleeves and handling more weight in something like a tricep extension. Um, you'll notice, like, if you look at the big bodybuilders even, those guys aren't working out totally raw a lot of times. A lot of times they're throwing on an elbow sleeve. There was a lot of bodybuilders wear belts throughout the entire workout, which is kind of funny, but if you think about it, they're handling dumbbells all the time. They're handling some heavy weight, and it, it sort of makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so I like I like the thought process there, where you're like, okay, you know, if, if they're going to be handling more weight, the next obvious thing would be wrist wrist straps and things, um, wrist wraps. What uh, when you when you say we are they usually your ideas or the other people working with you, and then also. What, how do you handle people being like, oh, it's just another compression thing, or oh, it's just another wrist wrap? Like, it's what makes yours so much better than? How do you handle that right. and position yeah. yourself? Right. Um, some of the things um, have uh, some particular designs to them. Um, this this thing, for example, the compression cuff. Um, it's 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 not anything like a neoprene sleeve. A neoprene sleeve doesn't really do much for you at all, other than give you like a little bit of warmth. And what a neoprene sleeve is also doing is, it, is by putting it like on your forearm or your elbow uh, or even like your knee, it's just basically creating more surface area. And so when you go to lift, you're getting some compression um, just like you would if your forearm was touching your bicep in a bench press, you're coming down like this and you're able to push back. Now you have a larger area. It'd be, it'd be like if you just added a half an inch to your arms. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So it kind of works in that fashion. It works similar on the on the legs when you have it on your calf slash knee slash hamstring. As you're going down, you're cushioning off of that a little bit and then coming back up. But the compression is not so great that it's really doing much of anything. Anyone would tell you that has ever worn a knee wrap versus a knee sleeve. Uh, That's why there's two different categories in powerlifting, a a knee wrap category and a a category uh, where people are allowed to wear knee sleeves is because a knee wrap is much more uh, is much more supportive. It's going to give you more kick, and that's what these are made out of. This is made out of like a knee wrap type material that's going to give you a little bit more spring. When you put this on your elbow, especially if you were to wear one that was kind of tight, mm-hmm. um, you're going to be able to bench um, a small percentage more than than what you'd be able to bench without it. I mean, I can't really give you like an exact number. I would say if I was to be pinned down for an exact number, I'd say maybe 10 to 15 pounds more. Yeah. But an elbow sleeve is not going to really allow you to, to, to bench anything more, if, if at all. It's probably bench similar weight. Uh, the only thing it's going to do is provide a little bit of warmth, which which can, which can assist a little bit in taking away a little bit of pain. So my compression cuffs are superior just because they, they have a different form of compression. They're just on there tighter, and a compressed muscle is going to be a stronger muscle. Uh, with a neoprene knee sleeve or elbow sleeve, you're not really getting hardly any compression at all. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the wrist wraps, um, my wrist wraps are multi-purpose wraps. The Velcro is longer; it's elongated, and so you can take my wrist wrap and you can basically put it anywhere. You can put it on your wrist, your forearm, elbow, uh, knee. You know, I've had people wear them on their on their quad that have hurt their hurt their quads before groin. All kinds of things because the Velcro is longer, so it can attach easier. A regular wrist wrap won't wrap back around; you won't be able to attach it. Gotcha. So those are some differentiating points there. Are those all things that you kind of, you know, looked at other things in the market and said, gosh, you know, they're, they're missing X, Y, and Z and let me provide that. Or are these people coming to you and saying like, Hey Mark, why don't you make a product that does this? Or maybe even business partners saying, dude, we should do such and such. Where's the ideation? No, you know, it's, uh, to be honest, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. A lot of it's, a lot of it's just me. Um, you know, I, my wife, uh, my wife helps me run the business, He's actually up there on the phone right now yelling at somebody. <laughs> but, um, you know, her and I, we do Power Magazine together as well, and we do the Slingshot uh, together. Um, and I do, have, I do have a team of people that assist me with uh, slinging out the Slingshots. But um, I, I, as you saw at the Arnold Classic, you know, we had a group there. And th- those are all the people I, I'll bounce ideas off of, but all the ideas have pretty much been mine. Nice. No, I kind of, I kind of like that. It, they always say, I, I, I forget the book. I think it's called like Strengths Finder or something. But it's like you know, the, in every business, there's the person that's better at like ideation, the person that's better at such and such and whatnot. And so, clearly, you have that talent yeah, you're for. You're gonna have to. Uh, you're gonna definitely have to delegate. You know, out some stuff. Uh, you know, as the business grows, uh, that's something that I'm dealing with now. Um, I have things. I have certain things that end up tying me up quite a bit. Um, that take a lot of time. I actually enjoy doing things like this because this is like an hour and it's, you know, it's just Q and A and it's quick. It's not something I have to like type. Mm-hmm. You know, if I have to write, it's going to take me like several days to get you good, an article that's worth anything. Sure. And so phone interviews and that kind of stuff is, uh, it's fairly easy, but yeah, it does get to be, it's a good problem to have, you know, cause it just means that you're sought after people. They want content from me and I'm giving it to them in every way that I can podcast powercast uh we got the, the power project we have uh, you know thing the media like this and then also uh, obviously the magazine supertraining.tv i'm just trying to give it to you as many different ways as i can nice that's awesome we appreciate that so with the slingshot like obviously with the with the wraps and the the cuffs and things like to me it makes obvious sense right to offer different sizes of course because you're gonna have different size right. people so that's easy but then on something like the slingshot and this is something actually i i deal with with kind of like another product line of mine and i'm sure a lot of people deal with is they have an idea like the slingshot it's working well and then it's like you get all those people that are going to tell you like oh no dude just like focus on the one one model keep it simple you'll be able to buy in larger quantities get better pricing right, on right. and on and on and then you've obviously launched several varieties of the slingshot like has that enhanced the business? Has that hurt it maybe a little, but you did it anyways because you knew there was utility for each? How do you tackle that? There's no uh, no hesitation. I, I don't I don't think about stuff like that. And I think that um, I think that when you do, you, you hamper creativity 
Um, I don't, I don't listen to like, I don't, I don't like marketing people. First of all, I just, I, I, I do think there's some people that have some valuable information out there in terms of marketing. Um, but I mean, even just simple stuff, like people will tell you like what time to like post something on Instagram, or what time to post. Them. It's like, well, it's a different fucking time everywhere in the world, you know, sure. there's different. So, and, and who's to say that, you know, you posting at X time against everybody else is a good idea versus you posting in the middle of the day randomly against nobody else, you know? Mm -hmm. So I listen to myself as much as I possibly can. And I try to go with my gut instinct. I do bounce ideas off people, but, um, you know, I've made several different versions of the slingshot and there was reasons for that. Um, everything I've done so far, there has been a reason for it. I haven't like I haven't created, I haven't created anything um, that I just wanted to create for no reason. Mm -hmm. uh, everything has kind of solved the problem. The slingshot solves the problem of people having sh hurt shoulders, hurt elbows, and they're still able to bench press. They're still able to do push-ups. They're still able to do dips. People can handle more weight. They can overload their body. Uh, they can handle more volume, more reps, more sets, more safely in their training. When I first made the original slingshot, which is the red one, um, I was not prepared for people to not be strong enough to utilize it. That mm -hmm. was a real shock for me. Um, it didn't have a hundred percent success rate. And I thought to myself, God damn, like I need to figure this out because I need everybody to be able to enjoy it no matter their strength level. Now, even the reactive slingshot was a step down, um, you know, we've had probably 95 or 98% of the people that have ever used it um, uh, have success with it. But mm -hmm. still, you know, you're going to have some people that can barely bench 55 pounds, and therefore the slingshot wouldn't necessarily be for them. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they would use a slingshot for push-ups or something like that. So I created the red one first. I created the blue one because I went to I went to uh, various, uh, you know, festivals like Arnold Classic and went to the Olympia trade shows and people couldn't use the red one as well as I, as I expected their elbows would shoot in or it was too restrictive and they couldn't do full range of motion work. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have a problem with that. I mean, it only happens, you know, two out of every 10 people that use it or something like that. But so I, then I created the reactive slingshot and the reactive slingshot ends up being uh, awesome for taller athletes, people that are, people that are taller, people have longer arms, people that aren't really thick, and it ends up being awesome for athletes, uh, basketball players, football players. Um, University of Notre Dame is using some of the stuff right now, and they're having a lot of success with it. But I always suggest to people like that, I know they're going to have a lot of mutants in their weight room. They're going to have guys that are 6'7", six, 6'8", six, and so on. Um, I just tell them, hey, order a bunch of the reactive slingshots because it's just going to be easier for you guys to use it. The full bore slingshot was a was an idea I had before I ever made the first one, um, mm -hmm. but I just was unable to come up with the right uh, pattern, and so I just went with, I said, you know what, I want to make this damn thing, so I went with the original slingshot first. The full bore one is the yellow one, and that's got an angled sleeve to it, and that's a little bit stronger than the red one, and then, of course, we have the Mad Dog one, which is a multi-ply, multi-layered one, and that one was created for powerlifters because once I made that red one, then every power if it was like, dude, I want to have more strength. Like, I want to be able to lift more in it. And that's not really, it's not necessarily the, the only point of the slingshot, but I created that necessity. I had to, uh, had to help my fellow power lifters out. Sure. So are you able to find, uh, can all those be done with one manufacturer, or you kind of have to source different materials and use different people? or? Um, some people have to use, you know, multiple manufacturers to get stuff done, but I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm able just to go to one and uh, have him crank everything out. That's awesome. And so for some people, you know, when they're getting ready to launch a product, I think um, I kind of like your idea within reason where it's just like, just start. Like you got an idea, you got a concept, like it'll it'll evolve over time and you'll you'll perfect it. But then there'll be other, there'll be other people that will say things like, for example, uh, Oh, well, you know, you, you got to think about your pricing strategy, right? Because, like, for example, now your products are picked up by bodybuilding.com. So, you know, do you start at a price that allows a middleman to come in? Or, you know, like, how did you have that kind of vision that you wanted to get someone like bodybuilding.com on board? Or did you always think you'd just be doing it on your own? Or Yeah, I haven't. I have not. Uh, you know, the slingshot's been going for about four years now. 
and uh, I haven't uh, come close to reaching my own expectations of the product just yet. Although I think that this year is uh, is probably going to be the year to do that. Um, I've always had the vision of it of it being a huge product and being a big success and being inside just about everybody's gym bag. Um, I would say in terms of like, I wouldn't worry about any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. I honestly would never, I would never worry about any of that shit in terms of like, you know, how much it costs versus how much you sell it and so on. I'd only worry about that after you have, have it made. Uh, whatever product it is that anybody is trying to make out there, they should just make it. Like make it for themselves. Make it for your friends. And it might be an investment. Now, you, you know, you, every once in a while you're talking about something that could cost a, a small fortune. But um, if it's something that's not too astronomical, something that you don't have to put too much money into, and, and, you know, search around, too. Look, you know, poke around, find some different manufacturers. If someone tells you, hey, man, the only way we can make that is, you know, it's going to cost eight grand, you might be like, shit, man, that's a lot of money. Then you might have to go, because they're going to tell you all kinds of stuff. They're going to tell you you need to order in bulk, you need to do this, you need to do that. You say, all I want is a prototype uh, to where you'll be able to find something. And you can tell you can tell people, say, if you give me a chance, if, if this works out, then we could be doing business for a long time. And uh, I would never worry about, like, price points or any of those things. I'm fortunate that my product is uh, not very expensive to make. So uh, for me, that worked out well. But if you have, you know, if you had, a, like, a, something in electronics or computers or something like that, then the cost would be, you know, astronomical in some cases. Sure. So when you first released the product, have you had to adjust your pricing back and forth? Or were you able to just kind of set one price and it worked? or? Yeah, we we haven't. Uh, the wife and I, we, you know, we we set those prices, and um, we haven't really had to go back and forth a whole lot. Um, when I first started the website, uh, we were able to do free shipping for a little while, and then we just realized that that's not a good idea, and so we were unable to do that. But now we, I think we still can't remember if it's still on the site. I think it is. It's seventy five dollars or more. We still have free shipping just because I hate shipping, and so. I always wanted to make that. I always wanted to make that offer, but yeah, we haven't had to go back and forth on the price too much. Um, there, there's like new products I have coming right now that actually should be in this week, and to show you how non-organized we are, uh, we will set the price when the product gets here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's just kind of the way, kind of the way I roll. I just uh, and I, I say the same thing about lifting: lift first, ask questions later. Mm-hmm. I had um, you know a whole new group of people come in this week to train. They didn't have a whole lot of you know I thought thought they would have a lot of questions because it was like it was a group from out of town and I thought that they wanted to sort of interview me or have me do some sort of workshop slash seminar. They didn't really have any questions, so I was like, all right, well let's just get you moving, get you lifting, and then the questions started coming out. So so once we had them start to deadlift. Uh, then they started asking more questions about deadlifting. They started asking questions about squat. It was just an easier, easier conversation. But I'd always say just do. You know, mm-hmm. Mikey says just do it. I'd say just do it and then figure everything else out afterwards. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. It's it's all the – there's nothing wrong with doing a little pa- planning and strategizing things, but I think people let that stop them so often from doing whatever it is. And Yeah, you're never going to have enough – you're never going to have enough, enough money to – to have a child, you're never going to have enough money to uh, get married. You're never going to have enough education to get the job you want, and so on. I mean, you have to kind of fake it until you make it, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You, you're not always going to be a hundred percent set up the way that you would, the way that you'd like. And there you have it. That's part one of a two-part interview with Mark Bell. So be sure to tune in within the next few weeks, and we will be airing the second part of that episode. Additionally, we also have some video from this uh, interview, and you can find that over on YouTube. The YouTube channel is Listen to Muscle. Uh, the only thing being the connection was a little bit uh, rough for us, and so we don't have full video on the entire episode, but some of the things that Mark's talking about in relation to his bands and cuffs and things, um, you'll be able to see a little bit of demonstration of that on those YouTube videos. So thanks so much for checking the episode out. Thanks for listening to Muscle, science and application. We'll be back tomorrow. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. Find us at AppliedMuscleScience.com.